For Hooker, then, it is a mistake to reduce every kind of law that directs the action of human beings to only the revealed law of Scripture. We indeed follow the scriptural law where it clearly directs us in our actions, whether in the moral life or directing us savingly to our final end. But not all of the laws that we follow, not all of the laws that we promulgate for society or for the church, come directly from scripture. For scripture is not the only source of laws for human beings in society or in the church, or as individuals. What Hooker says is we need to make distinctions among the various kinds of laws. There are some that are permanently binding, such as the moral law or the natural law, as well as the supernatural law that directs us to our ultimate end of union with God. But there are other kinds of laws that are not permanently binding, but they're only relative to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And these Hooker calls positive laws. And many of the kinds of laws we encounter in society and many of the kinds of laws that we encounter within the church are precisely positive laws that are not permanently binding. So Hooker makes distinctions, you see, in his interaction with the objections and cri criticisms of the radical Puritans against the Church of England. Now, in light of all of this, the question that I want to ask is how is the church to live under the authority of Scripture in light of what Hooker has said. Well, Hooker makes, again, another crucial distinction. This is what we uh, appreciate Hooker for. He makes distinct distinctions that clarify. So here is a distinction that Hooker makes. For Hooker, a crucial distinction must be made between doctrine and morals on the one hand and church order and polity on the other hand. In matters of doctrine and morals, we are bound to follow what God has revealed in Holy Scripture, or as the case may be in the book of creation itself. Indeed, many of the moral uh, laws that we follow, we can learn from both Scripture and through the book of creation. So when it comes to doctrine and morals, Hooker says, the church is not free to alter what God has laid down for all time and all places. On the other hand, when it comes to matters like church order and polity and uh, worship of the church, there are many things that are left up to the church's discretion. In matters like this, such as the church's polity, whether it will adopt a, an Episcopal polity or a Presbyterian polity. In matters of worship, such as whether it will use a Book of Common Prayer or some other common uh, pattern of worship. Whether the church will require its ministers to wear vestments like the surplus or, or not. Whether the church will require certain uh, patterns of worship like using the sign of the cross or not, all of these are matters of church order, polity, and worship, ceremony, and these are matters that are left up to the discretion of the church. And we don't look to the sole guidance of Holy Scripture in order to make up our minds on these matters. Scripture is concerned with uh, the supernatural law that directs us to our salvation, but it leaves to us in the church uh, a great deal of freedom of discretion. And this is where we, we seek to make sure we're not in violation of Scripture. This is where we seek as the church to use the God-given reason we have, as well as appeal to the tradition of the church. So Hooker does not... Uh, think kindly toward the notion of endless novelty. Uh, if a matter is not settled by scripture, then we use reason and tradition in order, in order to decide the matter. So uh, in very many ways, Hooker says, yes, we innovate, but in very many ways, he's, he's close to Jewel in his aversion to novelty.
But nevertheless, the church on these kinds of matters must be flexible and adaptable, using its prudence, uh, its common sense, and its appeal to tradition to decide how to approach these matters. The, the radical Puritans would say, uh, had said, uh, your church has strayed insofar as, as it does not look exactly like the church of the New Testament. Uh, Hooker responds, the church of today is not required to look in every way like the church of the New Testament. There may be ways in which we depart from the New Testament pattern in matters of church order and polity so long as we do not depart from the saving message that has been handed down um, uh, through the church throughout the ages. As long as we do not depart from the faith once delivered to the saints, the church is free to be flexible and indeed innovative within the bounds of reason and tradition regarding how it will approach these matters. So the church lives under the authority of scripture, yes, but the church also has authority regarding matters of order. So here's what Hooker says, in keeping with this distinction, distinction between doctrine and morals and order and polity. He says, the church hath authority to establish that for an order at one time, which at another time it may abolish, and in both it may do well. But that in which, but that which in doctrine, doctrine, the church doth now deliver rightly as a truth, no man will say that it may hereafter recall, and as rightly avouch the contrary. Laws touching matters of order are changeable by the power of the church, articles concerning doctrine not so. So you see there are constraints to the church's innovation as it moves through time and changing historical and cultural circumstances, there are limits to this. The church cannot change doctrine because the doctrine concerns that which directs us to our salvation. And this has been established as a law uh, or as an unchangeable uh, truth uh, that the church is meant to uh, uh, hold to and proclaim throughout every generation but in matters of order, not so. Uh, this is where people often talk about the so-called three-legged stool of scripture, tradition, and reason. Um, let me say a word about this. Uh, in his anti-Puritan polemic, Hooker does not de diffuse doctrinal authority on the lines, uh, along the lines of a three-legged stool of scripture, reason, and tradition. When it comes to matters of doctrine, uh, Hooker is very much in line with the earlier Reformation. The scriptures contain all things necessary for our salvation. So when it comes to matters of salvation, which is say matters of doctrine regarding who God is and what God has done for us and for our salvation, uh, the, script, the, the scriptures alone suffice. And uh, the the church does not need reason and tradition in order to fill out uh, uh, her doctrine regarding these matters. Uh, scripture alone suffices. Reason only as, let's say, a handmaiden to aid in the interpretation of scripture. Uh, but scripture alone reveals the truth regarding matters of doctrine, matters regarding our salvation. However, for Hooker, reason and tradition do have a kind of authority. They have an authority when it, they exercise authority over the life of the church when it comes to matters of order, matters of polity, matters of ceremony. In matters like these, we appeal to the three-legged uh, stool, scripture, reason, and tradition. So I hope that distinction is clear. Uh, Hooker's not diffusing doctrinal authority among these three authorities. Um, rather, he is uh, he's allowing reason and tradition to aid us in uh, the development of laws pertaining to matters of order. So here is there's a kind of descending rank of scripture, reason, and tradition. So in matters of doctrine, we appeal to scripture alone, but in other kinds of matters where the church uh, is allowed to use her own wisdom and discretion, then we appeal to the three-legged stool in a descending ranking of scripture, 
reason, and tradition. So here's what Hooker himself writes in Book 5 of the Laws. He says, be it in one, be it in manner of the one kind or of the other, that is, doctrine or order, what Scripture doth plainly deliver, that to the first place both of credit and obedience is due. So no matter what the kind of matter is, uh, if Scripture speaks clearly, we, uh, we appeal to Scripture uh, and we defer to Scripture's authority. The next whereunto is whatsoever any man can necessarily conclude by force of reason. So scripture is not clear on a matter. It must be in first a matter of order. And then uh, if it is a matter of order and scripture is not clear uh, or does not clearly establish a law that is binding for all times and all places, then we may use our reason in order to discern what is uh, the best path according to the use of our own lights. After these, the voice of the church, that is tradition, succeedeth. So if, if reason and tradition don't dictate quite clearly the path the church ought to take in one matter of order or another, uh, then we appeal not just to whatever we want to do, uh, but then we appeal to what? The tradition of the church. So Hooker is very clear in how to use these three sources of authority. Um, we must make the crucial distinction here again between doctrine and order. Well, the the radical Puritans did not make this kind of distinction. There weren't matters of primary importance and secondary importance to the Puritans. There weren't matters uh, that were, on the one hand, doctrinal, and on the other hand, matters of order. Really, everything within life and everything within the church was subject to uh, the direct commands of Holy Scripture. In Hooker's mind, this failure to distinguish these things, the failure, let's say, to distinguish between changeable laws and unchangeable laws, leads to significant theological and pastoral problems that I want to highlight. Uh, to confuse the two, matters of doctrine and matters of order, changeable laws and unchangeable laws, is uh, both to elevate too highly matters of secondary importance, matters of temporal existence, how the church governs itself, or how the church worships in, in the particulars of its uh, ceremony. Um, it, it elevates those matters of secondary importance too highly, and therefore it obscures the matters of central importance. Do you see this? If every matter that the church that comes before the consideration of the church is as important as every other matter, uh, that seems to suggest that, well, the doctrine of our salvation. Uh, is now on an equal plane with how the church worships in the particulars of its ceremonies. Don't you see this is elevating too highly the importance of the church's ceremonies, and it's obscuring the fact that what really matters is the doctrine of our salvation, you see. Hooker says we need to be pragmatic. We need to use our reason, appeal to tradition, yes, when it comes to matters of secondary importance. When it comes to matters of order, uh, pragmatism is what we appeal to. So why do we uh, like the rule of bishops in the church? Uh, because it, it works, and tradition has shown that it works for the church, and therefore we, we keep to this. Why does the Church of England worship as it does? Because this is a pattern of worship that is edifying to the people. Are there other ways to do it? Yes, certainly. Uh, is this a good way to do it? Absolutely. And in, it is therefore edifying to the people. It builds them up. Therefore, the Church of England does it. So he, he's pragmatic about these kinds of secondary matters. On the other hand, he is deeply contemplative when it comes to matters of salvation. So Hooker has this kind of odd combination. He's both pragmatic and deeply contemplative, um, which is why uh, I think Rowan Williams, in a great essay on Richard Hooker, says it well. He says he is a contemplative pragmatic. Uh, it just depends what kind of issue it is. So the Puritan failure to distinguish 
changeable from unchangeable laws, matters of doctrine from matters of order, matters of primary importance and matters of secondary or tertiary importance, leads to both pastoral and theological problems. Let me just say a little bit about the pastoral problems. Hooker thought that the radical Puritans were guilty of binding the consciences of people with indifferent matters, which which has this effect. It inevitably undermines Christian assurance. If I need the direct command of Scripture to do even such a simple action as pick up a piece of straw from the ground, then I am uh, in, on a path that will lead me to... Uh, a crisis of assurance for how can unless I have an encyclopedic knowledge of Holy Scripture uh, how can I be sure that I have scriptural warrant for every um, minute action that I do in life that is extraordinarily difficult but it, look if if everything that is not of faith is sin and if I am not being faithful unless I am being obedient to a clear command of Holy Scripture, then I can never be sure that I am in anything but a state of sin. For how can I get scriptural warrant for every uh, any manner of variety of actions that I carry out in the course of the day? Do you see how this will undermine Christian assurance? How do I know that I'm conforming to all of the details of the biblical law? How can I ever know that I have done this adequately? Martin Luther staked his reformation on the notion that we can get assurance of salvation through the word of scripture, but because the Puritans have expanded greatly the scope of scripture's authority, far beyond what God has intended, says Hooker, they are undermining the very assurance that Hooker, uh, that uh, Luther accomplished in his doctrine of justification by faith. And so Hooker saw in the radical Puritanism of his day uh, a problem of assurance, which is a deeply pastoral problem. Which is why he says in his preface to the laws that he his his state is per, his stated purpose is to resolve the conscience of those who are concerned regarding matters of law, to resolve the conscience. So the failure to distinguish primary matters and secondary matters, the failure to distinguish changeable laws and unchangeable laws leads to a problem of assurance, and this is what Hooker addresses himself to in his of the laws of ecclesiastical polity. It's not just a theological work. Uh, or a, a speculative treatment of law. It's also a deeply pastoral work. Second, the theological problem. By flattening the hierarchy of laws, the radical Puritans obscured the central importance of the doctrine of salvation by making it just as important as matters of order. It, it, it flattens out that hierarchy of law and then every matter becomes as important as every other because it's What's at stake in everything? Our obedience to the word of God, lest we fall into a state of sin. Good theology dem demands that some matters are more important than others. Furthermore, furthermore, by claiming that scripture contains not all things necessary for salvation, but simply all things, the radical Puritans raise the stake of every possible disagreement. Because every disagreement that arises in the, in the church regarding the interpretation of Holy Scripture becomes a matter just as important as any other. Which means the stakes of disagreement are incomprehensibly high. And this is exactly the kind of thinking that leads to the fragmentation of the church in hundreds if not thousands of different denominations that split over the most minute issues. Hooker uh, almost anticipates this and says we, we need to make distinctions between matters of primary and secondary importance lest the stakes of any disagreement are far too high. And that leads to a theological problem. So in Hooker's mind, there's both a pastoral and a theological problem to the uh, radical Puritan failure to draw the right distinctions. Living under the authority of Scripture does not mean we, we 
for Scripture to speak to every matter, whether it intends to or not. Well, let me now just simply draw a conclusion. By distinguishing the various kinds of laws that direct our lives as human beings, Hooker is able to articulate a convincing answer to our opening question. How do we distinguish faithful innovation from unfaithful innovation? The church's laws which govern polity and liturgy, that is to say matters of order, uh, must be prudential, circumstantial, and flexible. We're moving through time and the church has to use its reason and appeal to the tradition as best it can in order to come up with an arrangement um, that is beneficial and edifying to the people when it comes to matters of polity and liturgy. The church moves through time and has to be therefore flexible, prudential, and creating laws that fit the circumstances. These laws are generated indeed by the church in her interaction with scripture, her use of reason, and her appeal to the tradition. On the other hand, in matters of salvation, in matters of doctrine, and in matters of morals, the church must faithfully reassert the revealed truths of Scripture absolutely subject to its authority. So when it comes to uh, whether innovation is good or bad, Hooker says it depends. It depends upon what kind of matter is up for discussion. Is it a matter of doctrine? Then innovation is uh, absolutely to be avoided. If it is a matter of order, well, perhaps we can innovate, perhaps we won't. Uh, let us draw out treasures old and new, uh, but then Hooker would say, well, we'll just go with the old, for indeed he was a quite traditional fellow. So I suppose in the end, after making all of these distinctions, we're sort of back where we were with Jewel. How does Hooker feel about novelty? He doesn't quite like it. He knows that it's necessary at times, but wherever we can avoid it, uh, let's avoid it. Let's avoid it by using scripture, uh, tradition, and reason. Um, uh, using the God-given reason and lights that God has given us, uh, Hooker says, let us, uh, with fear and trembling, move through this world in confidence that uh, as long as we place our faith in Christ, we are moving in the direction of our final end of union with God, which, praise the Lord, that's what we'll be discussing next week. Goodbye.